Hi, I'm Kelly Vaughn, and welcome to Inside ND. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the disabled and uh, their ability to get around better than ever through Indigo. And this is something I was not even aware of. And a lot of us are either um, impacted by disability or we know someone who has a disability or perhaps a relative or a loved one. And so you're, you're going to want to stay tuned for this, um, what's available and how uh, we plan to make it better for the future. And joining us to talk about in that, that and more is Jordan Patterson. And you are Special Programs Manager for Indianapolis Public Transportation uh, Corporation, which is Indigo. Indigo. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Kelly. Glad Welcome to, to the show. Okay, so uh, it's called Open Door Paratransit Service. Uh, and so tell us what that is and how you serve uh, those in our community. Yes, so Open Door is a reservation-based shared ride service for those who qualify based off of criteria set forth by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so if there is a disability that prevents a user from using our fixed route service, then they could be eligible for Open Door. Um, and it's about providing access, the same access to our fixed route users um, is the same access that we want to provide to our open door users, okay. people with disabilities. So typically when I go to catch the bus, uh, which is really a cool thing to do, I grew up catching the bus and then later in life you go, oh, you start to drive. It's like, you know, it's nice to just sit back and relax and let somebody else do the driving. Um, but typically when I catch the bus, I'm going to a certain point in town to board the bus with other people. How does the open door paratransit service work as opposed to the, the existing system? Yes. Yeah, so the existing system, you just jump on and ride because this is reservation based. You do need to make a reservation at least one to three days before your scheduled trip. You pay in advance um, or pay on the bus in order to use it, just like you would a fixed route. And they will take you to your trip and uh, you schedule to have them take you back. Now, um, when we get on the open door paratransit service, are there other people on that bus as well? Because I have seen some pictures. In fact, we'll bring up some pictures of the actual bus itself. Um, are there other people there? And that's how the schedule works, like they're dropping different people off. How do you make that work and coordinate for so many different people? You know, that's actually one of the challenges. And it's a reason why we are um, looking to get input for how we operate paratransit service in the future. Uh, we know that demand is growing for paratransit service just based off of a growing aging population. So Indigo is seeking to get input through a campaign we're calling it Beyond ADA. Um, and it seeks to understand how do we operate paratransit service outside of what is mandated by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, today, we operate paratransit service, I should say ADA uh, level paratransit service to the entire Marion County beyond what is required by ADA. But we're looking to be more efficient and provide a better experience for our users by thinking creatively about how we can operate outside of the mandated ADA area. Okay, that's refreshing to hear um, you know, someone who wants to go beyond what the minimum requirements are. So that that's encouraging and that, that's good to know. So, so tell us about this outreach effort that you have um, to get feedback from those who uh, would benefit from the service and beyond. Yes, so starting March 16th, all the way through April the 8th, we have several public input opportunities. These are facilitated discussions uh, about an hour and a half long each, uh, 11 totals what we have scheduled uh, as of now, but they are a way for uh, open door clients, service providers, and those who are stakeholders or have an interest in our paratransit service to come and give input about what our service looks like in the future. We have uh, several virtual options for people to attend, but also in-person options as well. And um, we are looking forward to hearing back and being collaborative with the community before we make any decisions about what the future of peer transit looks like. Okay, so with this broadcast being on uh, a Sunday evening, so the next one is what were the, what are the dates 
uh, of the upcoming um, uh, opportunities for people to participate virtually or in person? Yeah, so there are several opportunities in between now and uh, April to participate in this public input opportunity period. And so uh, the next meetings, uh, we've got one coming up on Tuesday, March 30th at 2 p.m., which is a virtual option. And then another one coming up on Thursday, April the 1st at 6 p.m., uh, which is also another virtual option. Uh, the following week, there are some in-person options and virtual options as well. For those who are interested in attending, they should visit indigo.net slash beyond ADA. We ask that people register at least 24 hours in advance. Because this is uh, a facilitated discussion, we want to make sure that there are enough in attendance to actually have meaningful conversation about the future of paratransit. Okay, so uh, so what happens when they chime in, say, uh, virtually with that discussion, and how long will it that discussion go on? So they can kind of plan in their calendar. Okay, this is going to take me an hour or two. How long do, do the meetings normally last? So we are asking those uh, who are participating in these meetings to show up on time because we want to re be respectful of your time. We're going to end uh, promptly an hour and a half into it. These are facilitated discussions. And so you can expect uh, the facilitator to ask questions about use and uh, what you like to see uh, moving forward. It really is a brainstorming type of session. And we're really looking to get ideas for how we operate our service. Okay. So um, any feedback from some of the earlier meetings that you've had in terms even maybe from one participant, what they suggested or what they're thinking for the future or have any feel for what people might say when they join that virtual call or when they uh, join in publicly at a meeting? You know, I'd rather not put any ideas out there. We want to go into future meetings with an open mind. Uh, I don't want to skew anybody's thoughts or suggestions. And so um, I'm really looking forward, and I think all of Indigo, our leadership, is looking forward to hearing uh, just what uh, the community is thinking. Okay. Okay. So, and again, folks, uh, you want to tap in. Let's put that out there several times during the interview, uh, Jordan, where they can go to tap into these virtual meetings or to learn more about the ones that are being held publicly. Where do they go again to get that information? To get so please, so please visit indigo.net slash beyond ADA. Again, that's indigo.net slash beyond ADA to learn more about this process, learn more about why we're doing this and also to register. And again, we're asking people to register at least 24 hours in advance of the meeting that you want to attend. Several options for meetings to attend, uh, but visit indigo.net slash beyond ADA okay. to register. So we need your help viewers. Uh, it may not be you. You may not be the person with the disability, but you know someone, everybody knows someone who has a disability that this would benefit. They perhaps have a transportation needs and need to tap into this. So let them know, give them a call and share that information. And we'll share it again uh, on the screen and at the end of the program as well. Call your friends and let them know. Everybody knows somebody um, who has been impacted in that way. So you, you mentioned the criteria set by the Americans with Disabilities Act. What, what are some of those criteria? Yeah, so there are several things in consideration. One is that we have to operate in the same area as the fixed route system, uh, which is defined as three quarters of a mile on each side of the fixed route. So that is a consideration. Um, it has to have comparable response time as our fixed route service. We need to be operating in the same hours as our fixed route service. Again, the purpose is to try to provide a comparable experience and to provide the same access as those who use fixed route. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, I commend you all for, for putting this together and getting feedback from the community. And it's so important that people who are watching follow through and help us with this effort to um, get that feedback from the, um, you know, from now, let me ask you this. Are you just wanting to tap into people who are disabled? Cause there are people, what caregivers. So is this open to anybody who, who, who could learn from this? This is open to anyone who could learn to this and would like to, um, kind of steer the direction for the future 
a paratransit service. We want our clients to participate, our open door clients to participate. We also want caregivers and service providers to be participating in these conversations uh, because they also have a stake in how air transit operates in Marion County. Okay, so whether so active users, caregivers, service providers, stakeholders, all of the above. And again, if you know someone, you know, uh, get them involved. We need those people to participate. Really important. So if you wouldn't mind again, Jordan, let's put it out there again, that where they need to go to sign up. Yes. Indigo.net slash beyond ADA. And I'll say it one more time. Indigo.net slash beyond ADA. Okay. And now let me ask you quickly before we wrap up, um, just how, how are things with Indigo in terms of uh, passengers in general and the, the general public using bus service in light of COVID-19? Has it been pretty busy or has it been slow? Yes, so safety of our riders and our coach operators are of utmost importance to us. And uh, we've taken several measures to make sure that we are uh, running service as uh, safely as possible. Transit is essential. And I think the pandemic showed just how essential it is. There were people who still needed to get to jobs still needed to go to the grocery store. And while we did see a decrease in ridership, I think we saw that all over the nation, but we still saw how necessary transit is. Okay, very good, very good. Well, we appreciate you coming on and letting us know about Open Door Paratransit Services and the new campaign that's underway to get people, uh, to get feedback from people, uh, especially those who are disabled, Uh, or those in that industry to make them aware of the services that you have available and how you're working so hard to make them better. (laughs) So Dorton Patterson, special programs manager uh, for Indigo. Thanks so much for joining us on Inside Indy. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. When I was growing up, my mom was extremely tidy. We were trained to put things back where we got them from. One day, when I walked into my mom's house, I felt like I walked to someone else's house. There was stuff everywhere. And just growing up, the way I grew up, and to see this transition was very alarming. When Sean talked to me, it was a wake-up call, and that's when I went to the doctor. Janet, it's nice seeing you See again. You, sir. you a good girl. Just let me know what I can do to help. Well, to help me, she'd have to help every day. Every hour, every ouch, every time my wife calls for help. I mean, maybe she could help me make her lunch, but the crust, all the crust has to be cut off the corners. She could help me run to the doctor for the fifth time this week. Help me with the specialist and the second opinions and the painful paperwork about paperwork. Help me deal with how hard it is seeing my wife's name on so much paperwork. But this is on me. I'm the only one who can do this, like this, for her. Besides... Take care. We will. <laughs> Janet doesn't like her cooking anyway. Find support for your strength. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Hi, I'm Kelly Vaughn and welcome to Inside ND. Uh, the month of October, uh, we paid a lot of attention to domestic violence and now we're into the month of November and actually... Um, Awareness about that topic should really never end. It's for every month. Um, and, but we're going to address it a little bit differently in this segment of Inside Indy. We, we're we're going to talk about a book that deals with domestic violence. Um, and I'm going to read an excerpt uh, from the back of the book um, from someone who's reviewing your book. Teresa. It says, T.A. Beasley writes a gripping and gritty tale of toxic relationships and deadly consequences that every female, young and old, should strive to avoid. This piece of fiction filled with twists and turns is not far from the truth and serves as a lesson to all. 
And that's from Sharon Oliver, the author of this book, It Happened to Me, Teresa Beasley is in the studio with us today, and we're going to talk to her about the book and uh, find out more about the twists and the turns. <laughs> and Wow. And this is a thick book, by the way. Yes. Tell us about It Happened to Me. Well, um, It Happened to Me is about um, two teenage girls that deal with the loss of their fathers, and it ultimately... Um, changes their relationship with their mothers. So some of the decisions that they're making are not decisions they should be making. So they enter relationships and deal with different things in different ways and ultimately mm. causes a lot of friction. Ooh, friction between? <laughs> um, between the people they're in relationships with, between their, their mothers. Um, so some of the, some things that happen, the perception that is received from like maybe a stranger um, kind of uh -huh. kind of intertwines and it kind of starts them going down paths that they shouldn't go down. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. Now typically, and I know you, is this your first book? Yes. That's my debut. Because you work to help other authors a lot in terms of uh, getting them published and that's, that's, your passion. Yes, right? yes. I love helping um, aspiring writers publish their books, mainly self-publish their books. I'm a big self-publish advocate, so I'm all about the indies, okay. like people that like to do it independently, okay. which is what I did for my book. Okay, so, so what, what made you, you know, you've been helping so many people, what made you decide, okay, I'm going to do It Happened to Me? Well, um, the, the first manuscript started back in 2009, um, and then I kind of put it aside because I did start helping other people ah. with their work. Um, and then I picked it back up, and about four years ago, I finally finished it and said, okay, come 2018, I'm going to put this, back, this book out. I've helped everybody <laughs> up, and I'm going to do uh -huh. it. <laughs> so I okay. finally got it all together, got it edited, um, got the book cover and everything done, and... It comes out October 18th. Okay, okay. So why? What, why and what inspired this book in terms of its content? Um, the inspiration comes from just me being an observer. I do a lot of research. So I observe like teenage girls, how they're dressed, how they walk, how they interact with adults, how they interact with each other. Um, and it kind of sparked just a, just the ideal uh -huh. um, so I said, well, a lot of teenagers now, the way they do dress and act, they don't understand that a stranger or even a person they family might perceive how they're acting and what they're projecting. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. they interpret it a different way. And a lot of times, sometimes that it brings danger. Mm. So that's where the inspiration from, from okay. the book came from. Okay. So give us, because uh, of course we don't want to give away the book because we yes. want you to go <laughs> out and buy it. Yes. But give us, um, tease us a little bit with, with some snippets from the book that would at least give us an idea, more of an idea of what we can expect. Um, well, at the beginning of the book, I will um, give that away. Um, Delilah, the main character of the book, she loses her father mm -hmm. to a tragic incident and she blames her mom for it. So that is where the breakdown in their relationship comes from. Um, her best friend, Tiffany, um, which is a substory inside the book. Her family, her dad doesn't die or anything. He just leaves. And she, in turn, blames her mom. So then that starts to break down in their relationship. Mm. So that's just a little bit of okay. what's going on. Um, okay. Now, as far as the relationship part, um, the domestic violence part um, comes within Delilah's relationship with her boyfriend um, mm. and some of his actions. Um, she realizes, should I stay or should I go? Um, maybe he's doing this just because he cares about me. But one incident that happens in the book ultimately tells her, okay, look, I've okay. got to get out of this. Wow. Okay. So she yeah. kind of decides, nah, uh -huh. I'm going to leave. <laughs> okay. Wow. And which is really uh, brave, especially for a young person. Yes. Because so uh, that's what we've been talking about um, on different shows this especially for the month of October about a lot of people don't even realize that they're in a domestic violence situation that's true, that's um, true. that it takes a while for the victim to realize it and of course people around her mm -hmm. 
are saying that, and points it out, but, but they, they don't. don't. They don't mm -hmm. see it. So why do you suppose that is that people can't see it when they're in? in I think it's the denial. They know it's there. They know it's happening, but they don't want to acknowledge that it's happening. Just like with the character in the book, she didn't want to acknowledge that this was going on. She mm -hmm. knew something was not right about it, but you know, when that person tells you, oh, I love you, I would never do that again. They believe that and say, okay, well maybe it's not what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go ahead and stay. And a lot of times that's what domestic violence is. The person convinces you that they love you and that they're never gonna do it again and that you should stay and we're gonna work this out. Mm -hmm. But it just, the cycle just goes over again. Now you, you, you talk about in the book how you have the two father figures. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying that they play a major role in how uh, we as women, whether we're young or older, how we process that information in dealing with a man or it, in terms of how, you know, to, to be, even be able to perceive how he's treating us, whether it's right or it's, or it's wrong? Yes, most girls and me included, we use our fathers as examples. Um, when we go into a relationship because every girl is looking for her father when she goes into um, mm -hmm. Trying to find a boyfriend or a husband or a partner We think of our fathers. So if I can find someone like my dad, then I'll be fine, but Sometimes you think you got your father, but you really didn't Ooh. get your father <laughs> <Ooh. Okay. laughs> You're know, getting some totally opposite. So a lot of times I think girls do go into relationships with their father's image in the back of their mind. Okay. So even though I said I wasn't gonna be like my mom, I ended up going down okay. that path anyway. Are we seeing you in any of these characters? In the a book? little bit. A little bit? <laughs> <You> <laughs> she could have just said that from the beginning. A little bit. Um, <laughs> Which some character? Or is, it, or is there a little bit of you it's in a, both It's characters? a little bit of me in all the characters. Right. Uh, well, except the males. Um, right. And the okay. moms and, and the two girls. Wow. You'll see a little bit of my sassiness and, you know, okay. when you're young, you think you know everything, but you really don't. No, all right, yeah. <laughs> you really yeah. don't. So what do you want people, do you want people to read this as, oh, as, as fiction and I'm enjoying it and the twists and the turns and, or is there a lesson? And what is that lesson? Um, the lesson is be careful who you befriend be careful who you talk to, and when you leave your home, make sure you're leaving it in the correct way. Because the main thing in this book is when you're doing certain things or your appearance or how you're acting or interacting with other people, the consequences might not be what you want them to be. Because mm -hmm. the person that you're, you're showing off for might interpret it the wrong way. Okay. So that's the main thing I want readers to. That's why I want a lot of young, teenagers to read the book or either their parents to buy the book for them. Ah, and Christmas is fast approaching? Fast approaching. So best, what yes. a great holiday. Great holiday gift, gift. yeah. Okay. Because uh, I, I wrote it for teenagers and that's why the dedication in the book is to all teenage girls whose choices they couldn't come back from, who's mm. made choices that they couldn't come back from. How do we get the book? Um, the book will be available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, iBooks, and um, Nook in Kobo. Um, they can also get it also from my website, um, www.tabsley.weebly.com. Um, but mainly they can get it from Amazon. Okay, okay. Sounds good to me. Well, we're really <laughs> proud of what you're doing and helping Thank other you. authors and now writing your own book. Uh, Teresa Beasley of It Happened to Me. Be sure to get a copy for yourself and for your sisters and for your auntie and for your mom. Just yes. go ahead and order a dozen of them, huh? And your friends. And Don't your forget friends. your friends. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much for join, for writing this. Thank thanks you. For joining thank us you. on Inside Indie. And thank you for having me. All right. <laughs> uh, we'll be back with more here on Inside Indie after this. What would you do if you woke up one morning to find your street blocked with a house in the middle of it coming your way. Hi, I'm Bill Foster, founder and executive director of Habitat for Missions. Our organization purchases houses and then develops them with volunteer workmen. We then sell the house and give 90% of the profit away to support missions around the world. 
Just recently, Habitat for Missions supported church planning missionaries in the Czech Republic, building a vocational school in Uganda, providing a safe place for girls in India, partnering with an overseas mission organization and homeless shelter in Indianapolis. And that house moving towards us in the street, when the project is complete, will help at-risk teens in South Bend, Indiana. There's so much more we can do with your help. Whether it's moving a house in South Bend, renovating an old mansion in Georgetown, Kentucky, or sprucing up a home in St. Petersburg, Florida, Habitat for Missions is investing in lives. One house, one flip at a time. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your favorite brother, your other brother, you, yes. your football buddy, your football buddy, you, the boss, the boss's boss. If one in three adults has pre-diabetes, that means it could be you, your barber, your barber's barber. Nice work. Thanks. Thanks. You. Your plumber. Breathe right into your foot. Your plumber's masseuse. Yes. You, your dog walker. On your left. Your cat jogger. Or you, your co-pilot. Your co-pilot's co-pilot. While one in three adults has prediabetes with early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org to know where you stand. <laughs> Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you.